I think, for many fans of the Elder Scrolls series, one of the most consistently appealing and unique things about the franchise, its game world and lore, is the cosmic conglomerate of godlike beings known simply as the Daedric Princes. A pantheon of 16 enigmatic, unique, ancient, and oftentimes antagonistic lords that each hold domain over a very specific sphere of influence and power here in the in-game universe. For instance, you got dudes like Malakath, Daedric Prince of Curses, Sanguine, Lord of Revelry, Hermaeus Mora, the Demon of Forbidden Knowledge, so on and so forth. It's a real fun crew, you can imagine. But within the actual games, these are always like larger-than-life characters, and ones that directly impact the path of the player. In Interacting, interfering, well, sometimes even outright opposing us as we attempt to save the land of Tamriel over and over again. But even though these princes are absolutely godlike in both power and stature, they ain't at all everyday gods of casual worship across the world. But instead, you could almost think of them like anti-gods, or even demons. The darker and more interpretive side of the divine coin, if you will, the idols of cults and whispered prayers. Deities that do not seek to serve mankind in any way, but instead use it for their own cryptic and sometimes sinister games. And while every one of those princes absolutely has their own unique personality, aesthetics, and agenda, there is one of the 16 that has amassed a very special sort of fandom amongst us, the players. Players. One that stands out to me as, well, quite a bit different from his peers. A prince with a wicked sense of humor, a love for the arts, a taste for fashion, an appreciation for cheese, and a prince that just so happens to be completely and utterly insane. Cheese for everyone! Wait, scratch that. Cheese for no one. That could be just as much of a celebration if you don't like cheese, true? I am talking about none other than Sheagorath Daedric Prince of Madness. Oh, baby. I gotta say, this is by far the single most requested video since the day my channel was born, and here we finally are, boys, in a brand new video series altogether meant to highlight characters just like this that we simply cannot toss in the good or evil pile. The Trickster. The Mad Star, the Skuma Cat, the Lord of the Never There, Uncle Sheo. He has many, many names and aliases, but only one abstract purpose, uh, I think. Huh? A force of unfathomable power, potential, and unpredictability in the Elder Scrolls series. A god that is truly neither hero nor villain, but something much more interesting altogether. And simply put, dude, one of the greatest and most fun characters in the history of video games, period. So, of course, as always, I want to dive in deep here and cover it all. I mean, what would the purpose of a god of madness be in an RPG? How does he stack up against some of his more edgy and dark brethren? What is his strange and intimate connection to the Daedric Prince of Order? How do his appearances differ over the years? And, well, why is he so completely insane? Well, before we continue, I actually need to ask you one more very, very important question. Have you or a loved one recently had a run-in with a certain god of insanity, upset him, and ended up having your entrails painfully removed and repurposed into a jump rope? <laughs> Or maybe the carriage you decided to take across Skyrim to Winterhold crashed and left you hurt and unable to work. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Well, if you answered yes to either scenario or find yourself otherwise injured and in need of a lawyer, then the sponsor of today's video is here to help. Morgan & Morgan is America's biggest injury law firm with over 800 attorneys standing by right now. Because listen, man, an unfortunate fact of life is that injuries happen. Car accidents in particular are way more common than you'd think, with the US alone recording over 2 million every single year. But what makes Morgan & Morgan special is the ease of access, dude. I'm talking eight clicks or less to submit a claim for review. And to make it even sweeter, you only pay a fee if your case wins. So there's really nothing to lose. Being injured can derail your entire life and livelihood, even for a Daedric Prince. And Morgan and & Morgan will always be there to fight for you. So check out the sponsored link in the pinned comment to support this channel. And thank you very much, Morgan & Morgan, for sponsoring today's video. So to understand the Prince of Madness, his purpose, and especially his origin, I think we first have to dig into the Daedra at large, the relationships they share with each other, with mortals, and really just divine history dating back to the creation of the mortal plane. So if you listening or fancy yourself an Elder Scrolls veteran, feel free. Skip up to the next chapter, I'll see you up there. 
But I think if you know even the smallest bit of lore on this series, you probably know that there's like a lot to it, especially when it comes to the more ethereal, religious, or historical aspects of the story. I mean, even the different in-game races have their own unique versions of the gods, the mythology of creation, and even the recounting of certain world events. It's something that I believe gives the game world a ton of believable depth and nuance, but also, for sure, makes finding the so-called fictional truth very, very tough. So everything in this video is, as always, just my interpretation and opinion. Please share yours below so I can tell you you're wrong. Nah, I'm just kidding. So then I guess the story of Sheagorath really begins in the primordial soup of space. Back in a time when all there was in existence was a divine race of energy beings known as the Et Ada. The Et Ada are also referred to as the original spirits, spirits that were made up of the essence of the primal forces categorized as light and dark. Now, who knows what these Et Ada dudes got up to in the timeless sea of the cosmos back in the day, but one of them was a particularly imaginative and restless spirit we know as Lorcan. You see, Lorcan somehow got a bunch of the other Etada to help him out with a little something. Uh, just a project that he had been thinking about for a while. I don't know, let's call it the creation of all material space in the mortal plane. AKA, the creation of Mundus, the realm of existence that holds the planet Nern, and in turn, holds the land of Tamriel where all of these games take place. But this act of creation was one that sapped those specific spirits of their divine power, making them much lesser spirits. Now this is really where divine history is up for interpretation. Some races believe that the Etada who helped Lorcan out with the creation of Mundus were tricked into doing so, duped into weakening themselves while others believe that it was a selfless act, certain spirits just volunteering, raising their hand, hey, I'll be weakened, and all poured their energy into the creation of life willingly. But whatever you personally believe here, it doesn't really matter, man, because this split the Etada big time into those who assisted Lorcan and, well, those who did not. And these two groups of gods would eventually be known as the Aedra, which is Old Elvish for ancestor, and the Daedra, Old Elvish for not our ancestor. Eight of those Aedra came to be known as the Divines, or the basic gods of the world, but always remained weakened and tied to something called the Earth Bones. Now, this just means that they are essentially in stasis, weak, and can even be killed. The Daedra, on the other hand, they were laughing the entire time from the sidelines as they retained their full primal power and thus are wild, free gods of their own pure nature. So, they are seen in many places across Tamriel as a danger, demonic gods that cannot be trusted and have absolutely no love for mortal life, mysterious and freaky entities that see those in Mundus as simply a game to occasionally toy around with. And to be honest, that belief is not very far off, boy. But the princes, those 16, are just the most powerful of all Daedra. So powerful, in fact, that they each have their own piece of real estate, an entire realm within Oblivion, which is sort of like the hell or netherworld of the Elder Scrolls series where all the Daedra reside, with each prince's plane reflecting its master's nature, aesthetics, and personal agenda like we said earlier. But what if I told you that this original shakeout of divine events and this initial roster of princes did not include a Lord of Madness at all? You heard me right, man. Sheagorath was never there from the start at least not in the form that we all recognize him in. Now, as hard as it might be to believe, this wild bastard was originally a different prince altogether, Jigalag, Daedric Prince of Order and Deduction. Now, it's very important to note that Oblivion, much like the princes that rule over it, is by and large a wild and lawless place, representative of all of that change and untamed power of these gods. And I personally, honestly, would say that the very existence of a Daedric Prince of Order is almost oxymoronic. Literally all of the other Daedra, big and small, seem to operate on a sliding scale of chaos, especially the princes when it comes to the control over their spheres, bargaining with mortals, messing around with each other, causing issues on Mundus, really whatever they want to do to kill time, have some fun, and of course, amass more power. But alas, Jigalag indeed existed and ruled with a gray, monotonous iron fist over his specific realm of oblivion for an undetermined but immense amount of time. A humorless prince that may have lacked personality and flair but made up for it with this calm, cold, and calculated curation of all things. An OCD lord of singular purpose and focus as he attempted to set the cosmos around him in, well, order, in a manner that would please his very nature. And in doing so, this guy rubbed every single other Daedric Prince the complete wrong way. 
And I gotta say, man, I just love the idea of this ageless spirit of dark energy gaining consciousness at the beginning of time, and he just like immediately starts cleaning the place up, alphabetizing, organizing things. What a dweeb. But hey, dweeb or not, from the beginning of his existence, Jigalag amassed knowledge and power with a terrifying efficiency. His main calling card and ability was that of godly foresight. I mean, he knew with some semblance of certainty every single event or action that would ever take place past, present, and future on both Mundus and in Oblivion, perhaps even beyond. To him, the history of existence was already largely written, thus the main task he bestowed upon himself and his immortal Chamberlain Dias was simply recording all of these logical predictions within a great library. A library that would act as the crown jewel of his constantly growing, dull, deductive neighborhood. A neighborhood that, as Jigalag's power expanded, quickly spread like a symmetrical plague across realms and dimensions, threatening to swallow other princes' spheres of oblivion whole and bring them under his control and order. I mean, it's even said by some that Jigalag was the only prince who knew his true purpose, which is a simply terrifying concept. And it's hard to imagine, right? A god that powerful literally being able to, like, oh, I don't know, wage war with another prince and already know his opponent's full sets of reactions and defenses. Not to mention the sort of issues he could cause in the mortal realm. Holy smokes, man. I mean, as far as we are concerned, this is absolutely one of the most powerful and threatening characters in the entire Elder Scrolls canon. But now you might justifiably be thinking, like, how is this guy a Daedra at all? Because order in many ways represents stasis and uniformity, things that, as we have stated, really don't align with Daedric nature and instincts. And sometimes, to me, honestly, over the years, Jigalag has seemed much more like a lost Aedra, or just something else entirely, a god of a sort of static but constantly growing power. But ultimately, I would argue that this nature of setting things in line, the predictive logic and deduction, is still absolutely absolutely representative of that Daedric concept of change. But it's just that it's the change that comes by sapping the mystery, the color, and the life out of all existence. The final change, to end all changes, if you will, a prince who kind of accidentally was built to conquer all of his kin and make Oblivion, Mundus, and the universe a much more boring, safe, and homogenous place. But hold up now, partner, because you are the crazy one if you think the other Daedric princes would just kind of stand around and let this boring totalitarian homie spread his nasty order all over the damn place like he's the Pixies from Fairly Odd Parents. And believe it or not, as powerful and mysterious as the other 15 princes are in their own right, Jigalag at one point completely terrified them to the core, and each prince independently knew that they stood no chance standing up to him alone. Some legends even say that Jigalag had grown grown so powerful that he once ruled over all of his brothers and sisters with his eyes on an unyielding eternal dynasty without equal across all planes of existence. Yeah, now that ain't gonna fly, man. So, of course, the other princes had had enough, and in an absolutely unprecedented show of cooperation, they banded together against their common enemy and decided to do something, in my opinion, particularly cruel. Instead of just destroying or banishing the Great Prince, they came to the decision to curse Jigalag. Curse him to become his very own worst nightmare, the thing that he despised above all else the personification of the very concept that he was attempting to eradicate from the fabric of reality. And as the other 15 channeled their energy, focused their malice, jealousy, and fear, poof, in an instant, Jigalag was transformed into a Daedric Prince not of order, but disorder, not of symmetry, but irregularity. Where once stood logic, there was only madness. He was now Sheagorath. Now, who knows all the details of this confrontation, right? Perhaps there was some sort of cosmic conflict, epic wars between these princes for millennia, but all those tales are lost to time. All that matters is that in the blink of an eye, Jigalag was replaced with an absolute loon, a crazy son of a bitch who found himself suddenly self-aware with no memories of his previous identity, fabulously dressed, entirely hilarious, and surrounded by a world of monochromatic order. I'm sure he was disgusted. So Sheagorath then likely shrugged, chuckled to himself, and immediately set about redesigning the place to fit his liking. His dimension was remade to be the Shivering Isles, the great library of logic burned to the ground, and Dias locked away forever. The threat to the other princes, seemingly, was caged away inside of a madman, and all of Oblivion breathed a collective sigh of relief. But there is definitely one little caveat here in regards to the Curse of Madness. You see, at the end of every era, 
Sheagorath is destined to turn back into Jigalai in a fabled event known as the Grey March. This sees old Jiggy get jiggy with it and destroy the Shivering Isles completely, then regain power over his realm, only to turn right back into Sheagorath once he succeeds. The Prince of Madness then gleefully rebuilds the place and the whole pattern begins anew. Madness always yields to the March of Order. So you really have these two opposing forces, opposing princes who are one in the same. An unending cycle of destruction and creation, deduction and addition. This is some of my favorite lore in any video game I have ever played regarding any character. Shagorath's origin story and fate is simply incredible to me, but also lightly tragic and twisted. There's really just nothing else like it out there for me. However, I want to be very clear that although the threat of Jigalag was contained, Sheagorath in his own right is absolutely one of the most powerful of all Daedra period and remains a total thorn in the side of the other princes for all time. He is absolutely no slouch. But now, I would love to give you all a much broader picture of the personality of Sheagorath, his role in the mythos of Tamriel, and then talk a bit more about the moral lines that we tend to draw around characters just like this. Well, if you ask me, within the Elder Scrolls universe, you would be hard-pressed to find a character more grand and more unique than Sheagorath. He is of course most often associated with the concepts of creativity and insanity, with mortals who have lost their minds being referred to as Sheagorath kissed or Sheagorath touched. And really, any crazy guy hollering in a city square or weird old hermit types are all said to have communed with this prince, being told incomprehensible facts of the universe. But he is also affiliated with things like thunderstorms, misfortune, weather, and just unpredictability. And let me tell you, man, the history books of Tamriel are riddled with tales of men and myrrh alike that came to gruesome ends after worshipping Sheagorath. And I would say, in most corners of the world, he is absolutely feared on some level. Now, while every Daedric prince is a completely ageless, genderless being in truth, Sheo typically presents to mortals as a late middle-aged, bearded gentleman with a charming two-tone suit of fabric, an elegant cane or staff, and devilish wit. Unless, of course, you are a Khajiit, in which case he is Shegarath the Crooked Tail Skuma Cat. But that is beside the point, because I think for us as the players of these games, the thing that really makes Shegarath shine as such a memorable character is the absolutely incredible personality and writing. I'm telling you, man, when you get to speak with this dude firsthand, it is simply something else. The Daedric Prince of Order. Or biscuits. No, no order. And not in a good way. Bleak. Colorless. Dead. Boring, boring, boring! The character is voiced and truly brought to life in the fourth game in the series by beloved and legendary voice actor Wes Johnson, who has actually voiced other princes as well as like half the characters in the game of Oblivion. But Shea Gorath is without a doubt his finest work, equal parts thespian and tormentor. His voice tinged with idle boredom, mischief, and impending violence. It's just so good. Oh! Oh, what kind of message? A song! A summons! Wait, uh, I know! A death threat written on the back of an Argonian concubine! Ah, those are my favorites. I mean, it is said that his favorite pastime is straight up torture, and he doesn't discriminate, man. He'll torture anyone, anything. According to legend, after he was cursed to be Sheagorath, the prince spent the first several thousand years of his existence carefully ripping apart butterflies, tormenting them slowly for just his own amusement and experimentation, I don't know. And the tales only begin there. In the in-game book called Myths of Sheagorath, three short stories provide further characterization that I just think is incredible and has to be mentioned here. The first story describes a stroll Sheagorath took in humanoid form around the mortal world, which after about 11 days and 11 nights, he deemed to be totally boring. But just as he was having that derogatory thought, a beautiful young woman walking by remarked how nice the singing of the passing birds was. So Sheagorath took a listen and he agreed, then immediately grabbed that woman and ripped her limb from limb, using her tendons to invent lutes, her skull and arm bones to invent drums, and the rest of her bones to invent flutes. He then gifted these like bloody pulpy instruments to the mortals nearby and just went on his merry way with a smile. This story is literally titled Sheagorath Invents Music. Fucking fantastic. 
The second story in this book describes an ancient king who was absurdly rational and I would say rather dull. He preferred order and function in his home and his city above all else, while the populace of his kingdom wanted to create art, party, and live lives of hedonism. This of course disgusted the king, so he passed various laws, outlawing art, festivals, and the building of any building that was not entirely practical. The people understandably hated this, so they prayed to every god imaginable to come and make their king revert his actions. And guess which one answered the bell? Sheagorath then visited that king in a dream, coming to him as an entire field of flowers, with each flower's center being the face of the mad god. And he told the king, I am the god of the creative and the deranged, and since you have no use for my gifts of creativity, I have decided to bless you with an abundance of my other gift. And from that point forward, every single infant born in this kingdom was completely insane. The king was eventually killed by his own son, the buildings were all painted in stripes on one side and solid red the other. The new king fed a stew of human flesh to his people, and the city again created crazy art and reveled in insanity. Sheagorath laughed all the way to the bank, watching from the Shivering Isles. Well, that one I find very interesting, because the way that this king character kind of mirrors Jigalag, you know, very fun stuff. But the final of these three stories might be my favorite one. So a great wizard comes to Sheagorath with a little deal. He says, hey man, I'll go out and make a thousand men go mad in service of you if you, Sheagorath, teach me greater and stranger magics in return. But in a very quick counter, Sheagorath says, hey man, how about instead, over the next three days, you stay here on the Shivering Isles and I will try to drive you insane. Then, if at the end of that period you are able to resist, I'll teach you anything you want. The wizard balked and tried to apologize and leave the prince's domain, but guess what man? It was way too late. The task had already begun completely on Sheagorath's terms. So then the wizard spent the next three days on the isles in pure terror. I mean, every plant, rock, and stream seemed to be mocking him. He didn't eat for fear of being poisoned and didn't sleep for fear of the prince invading his dreams. Then on the final day, Sheagorath appeared and the wizard cried out that he had turned every living thing against him. But Sheagorath simply laughed and responded that he actually had just been chilling, not doing a thing, and it was the wizard's own delusions that drove him insane. And so the wizard was mad, spending the rest of his life muttering to himself and anyone around him how Sheagorath is already within all of us. So this is just the kind of shit that Sheagorath gets up to. I mean, he literally just messes with people because he's bored. Sometimes that means he might do something horrendously gruesome. But now I really want to touch on the fact that this video is calling him neither hero nor villain. Because I would agree that right about now, dude is sounding rather villainous. But I think, when it comes to this character and understanding his morality or lack thereof, we need look no further than his realm of oblivion, the Shivering Isles, which is of course a total reflection of him. So, to start, this place is quite literally split into two very, very different and contrasting areas, one being called Mania and the other Dementia. Mania is representative of the light-hearted side of Sheagorath. It's colorful and crazy with large mushrooms and pretty vistas, towns of babbling madmen and happy-go-lucky revelers. It has the jester's spine mountains, the laughing coast. It's a place for insane fools for sure, but it's bustling with creativity, life, and opportunity. Mania is ruled over by the Duke of Mania, Thaden, and you actually go do a quest for him called Addiction, where you trip balls and go in this crazy cave trying to get a chalice for him. You gotta beat back these drug addicts with a stick. It's amazing. But on the other side of the aisles, you have dementia, a dark, depressing, and dreary place. A low, marshy, and swampy mess that's representative of the more destructive and crippling, cruel side of the prince. Its inhabitants are, well, not as happy, many of them cursed by Sheagorath. Places like Shallow Grave and the Hill of Suicides dot the landscape, and man, this is a place no mortal would want to end up in. This half is ruled over by Syl, the Duchess of Dementia, and during the quest for her, you see how paranoid she is of all of those around her lying, cheating, and attempting to murder her. But these are truly the two halves of the whole of madness. I mean, losing your marbles can bring great inspiration, freedom, creativity. There is no art, music, or spontaneity without Sheagorath, but madness can just as easily lead you down a dark, dark path of isolation, violence, depression, and death. 
Then furthering this theme, you have Sheagorath's capital city of New Sheot, which sits right on the line between the two regions, the districts of the city being Bliss and Crucible, with Sheagorath's palace and throne room literally straddling the line. And that is because he is master of all under this umbrella, and thus responsible for the potential good and inevitable bad of madness. I just think it's all so appropriate, well-designed, and perfectly executed on the Shivering Isles, and it would be irresponsible for us mortals to point at this fine dapper man and say he is good or evil. Now, usually on this channel, we would throw characters like that into the NPCpedia, but well, more on that later. But of course, the myths and stories of Sheo don't stop with the little three that I shared. There's another in-game book called Sixteen Accords of Madness, which chronicles all these various encounters and victories this dude has had over the other Daedric princes. Getting Malakath to kill his own son, winning a bet with Vermina by literally doing nothing, getting Hercene's mortal champion to maul himself to death, this guy is just a deviant, a total bastard, and I recommend you read every shred of anything that you can find on him in-game. But oh, God, okay man, I think for now that's enough backstory and discussion, because I really want to bite into the meat of this thing already and take a look at this prince within these games. I want to see what he's doing, what he's asking of us, and brother, it all begins in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. So Daggerfall is a very large game, man, we all know that. Lots to do and lots to see. But you gotta remember that this is definitely an age before Sheagorath and the other Daedric Princes were really explored narratively to the point that they are now. And his first appearance? Well, Sheagorath kinda looks like the dude from the Atlantis animated movie. Maybe that's just me, but he does look a little goofy. But of course, in all of these games, it is customary for you to embark on a very specific Daedric quest for each prince you meet. Sometimes it's to become their champion or just do them a little favor. Typically, for a rather sweet reward. And I just think it's always a great way to get the player familiar with these tricky gods. So here in Daggerfall, Sheagorath asks you to track down a battle mage and invite him to a tea party. Okay, just kidding, he changed his mind and now he wants you to murder him. Okay then. Well, if you go to the specified dungeon within the time limit, kill the battle mage, then go find the Sheagorath priest, you are given, for the very first time ever, the Daedric relic known as the Wabajack a staff that would become a huge part of this character and a wonderful representation of the sort of power that he can bestow on us. In Daggerfall, the staff turns any enemy or NPC into a random other enemy, a rat, an imp, a spider, a nymph, so on and so forth. Then much later in the game, as it's wrapping up, you can interact with Sheagorath a little bit again. In Aetherius, you can get his crossbow, but it's nothing too major. Here, it's a very tame, supporting role, and let's just say, the best is yet to come. Because in Morrowind, we actually get a ton more Sheagorath and even see a bit of growth with the characterization as well as his place within Dunmer culture, which is very interesting. So the Dunmer, or Dark Elves, are a race that actually openly worship certain Daedric princes, but only the ones that they personally consider good. Then there are the Bad Daedra, and well, Sheagorath is categorized as the fourth corner of the House of Troubles, the cultural term for the lords that are never to be trusted, aka, he's one of the Bad Daedra. And Sheagorath specifically is feared for his ability to test the faith and mental stability of the Dunmer people, as well as some treachery he enjoys causing within Marwyn's great houses. Worshipping him in any way is explicitly illegal here, even though there is an entire region of Vardenfell to the north named after him. But there is still an ancient shrine dedicated to his worship under the city of Vivek for you to discover and interact with. Now, if you personally have played Morrowind and visited that very city, you likely know about Bar Dao, the moonlit hovering above the metropolis. A massive, destructive object hurled from space and only stopped at the last moment by the great magic of Vivek himself and the power of the tribunal protecting the city and its people. Well, it is heavily theorized that Sheagorath was actually the one to send this object toward Morrowind, possibly for fun, to watch the region get completely obliterated, or maybe, I think, as a more personal gesture gesture of revenge, given how the tribunal outlawed mad god worship and disrespected Sheagorath so openly. But either way, through the events of the game Morrowind and moving forward on the Elder Scrolls timeline, thanks to you, the mysterious Vivek vanishes and Bar Dao 
completes its delayed impact, obliterating the city and killing countless people. Which then leads to a time known as the Red Year, where all the volcanoes around are erupting, and most of Vardenfell is completely destroyed. So while it may have taken a while, Sheagorath is directly responsible for a ton of death and evil in this part of the world, which is very interesting to me. But I do like that the game takes place before all those events, and yeah, you get to serve the Prince of Madness here in another Daedric quest. What is it, mortal? Have you come to be of service to Shagarath? That in and of itself speaks toward your madness. This pleases me. Fetch the Fork of Horopolation from the Mad Hermit near Alvadenia. Take care with him. He's not the most... stable man. So in classic Sheagorath form, he asks you to go and kill a bullnetch with a fork. Uh, okay. And if you do this, he grants you the Spear of Bitter Mercy, a very, very good weapon worth a bunch of money. I see you have completed my little errand. Well done. Perhaps you've gotten a taste of madness as well. Do not believe madness to be a curse, mortal. For some, it is the greatest of blessings. A bitter mercy, perhaps, but mercy nonetheless. Give me the fork of horopolation. I believe I have something more suitable for your needs. Go now. Remember what you have seen. But perhaps more interestingly in my opinion, in the Daedric quest for Azura, Queen of Dusk and Dawn, you learn about this little wager between Sheagorath and Azura. So they at some point discussed the concepts of solitude and isolation. Azura claims that a mortal would eventually achieve a level of peace and harmony living in solitude, while Sheagorath is like, nah man, anyone would eventually go crazy. So they are observing a dark elf lady named Raina Drolin with a time frame to see who ends up being right. And with the end of the wager quickly approaching, Sheagorath is attempting to cheat by sending servants to go torment the woman and make her go crazy. So you have to go intervene and preserve the purity of that little experiment. And I think this is a really cool little quest, because you see that as powerful as Sheagorath is, he doesn't always come out on top, and certainly doesn't give a shit about playing by the rules. Again, what a bastard. But I think moving toward Oblivion, we all know, man, that this is the main attraction, the climax of the entire Sheagorath experience to date. Because here, boys, he has an entire DLC dedicated to him called the Shivering Isles, which is possibly the best expansion set in the history of the Elder Scrolls franchise, and I don't say that lightly, man. It's also really where we get the meat of all of his backstory and lore regarding Jigalag, the Grey March, etc. But I will say that before that even released, in the base game of Oblivion, there is a normal Daedric quest to complete as usual, which involved finding his statue, then bringing him some lettuce, yarn, a soul gem, and spread some plagues for him. Then when you complete it, you are again just like Daggerfall gifted the Wabajack, which similarly transmogrifies enemies into various other things, but that is definitely overshadowed by this DLC. So, in essence, this expansion pack is centered around Sheagorath opening a door into the mortal world, inviting really anyone into his realm in hopes of finding a champion. Because for him, it seems that the era is coming to a close rapidly, and that of course means that the Grey March is about to happen. The Mad Star is fated to again turn into Jigalag and destroy the Shivering Isles. But maybe, just maybe, this time if he finds someone capable enough, this eternal cycle can at last be broken. And that is where we come in. So the DLC begins with, yes, a mysterious stone door popping up in Cyrodiil with this appearance of a multi-faced screaming head. It's very, very cool. And you find some suckers hanging around outside who went in and lost their damn minds. Then we hear Shagorath speak. Unworthy, 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 useless mortal meat, walking bag of dumb. A nice effort, though. Shame is dead. <laughs> These things happen. Bring me a champion. Rend the flesh of my foes. A mortal champion to wade through the entrails of my enemies. Really? Do come in. It's lovely in the aisles right now. Perfect time for a visit. So, of course, in we go, and we are greeted in a very small room by Haskell, Sheagorath's personal chamberlain and a wonderful character in his own right. Yes, what can I do for you? I imagine you're here about the door. Yes, you have entered, and now you are here. Amazing. Truly. And at last, when we decide we are up to the task, we are whisked away in whimsical fashion to the Shivering Isles.
I will never forget this moment when I was younger, man. Simply magical. So you meet some goofy ass, insane characters immediately, and the tone of Shagorath's realm is really set, which I find to be very charming and fun. I'm Fellas Sarandis. Don't breathe on me. But your first task is really just to make it through the Gates of Madness, to the lands of Mania and Dementia. But said gate is guarded by a gatekeeper, pretty big fella too. But lucky for you, you meet this psychopath named Jared Icefanes. Do the bones talk to you too? I want him dead. I need him dead. His bones are calling to me. Rumor has it you want him dead too. Now this bozo wants to go make some arrows with the bones of the old dead gatekeeper and then kind of storm the gate, try to kill this guy. So together, you do so, proving yourself to Haskell and the Mad Prince as capable enough to enter the realm proper. But once you get past those gates, the goal is very, very clear. Sheo himself is calling you to his palace for a little meeting, and once you finally get there, he has a few words about what he sees your purpose being. A new arrival! A shame about my gatekeeper. I'm so happy, I could just tear out your intestines and strangle you with them. <laughs> I suppose an introduction is in order. I'm Sheogorath, Prince of Madness, and other things. I'm not talking about them. I've been waiting for you, for someone like you, for someone other than you for some time. I need a champion, and you've got the job! A change is coming. Everything changes, even Daedric Princess, especially Daedric Princess. A Grey March is coming, and you're going to stop it. The details aren't important, at least not right now. Eternity is on a rather tight deadline. We'll get back to that later. So the first task for Sheagorath is a rather big one, restoring this site known as Zedillion, a relic from the Jigalag days of order that can act as like a bit of a mousetrap for intruders to the Shivering Isles. Because, well, oops, you killed the guy who was protecting the front gate. And man, this is a fun quest, because after restoring this big crystal thing, you get to play a minigame killing and driving a group of adventurers insane by making choices game show style as to what happens to them. It's a really, really wonderful representation of the sort of fun that Sheogorath has as a master of this dimension. But once you have restored Zedillion, Sheo really wants to get you more accustomed with the Shivering Isles, imploring you to introduce yourself to the previously mentioned Duke of Mania and Duchess of Dementia. Two halves, two rulers, two places. Meet and greet. Do what they will, so you know what they're about. And after doing a couple quests for them, it's becoming clear that the Grey March is not only coming, it's here, now. The Knights of Order are popping up all over the place, large crystals materializing like a fungus, and Sheo feels himself changing by the day. I already feel... not quite myself. Not quite someone else, but not quite myself. But I really think it's very important that he goes and sends you to do these other activities, because it really is informing us, the player, of every aspect of the sphere of power that Shagorath rules over. I mean, the contrast between his two groups of warriors, the Dark Seducers and the Golden Saints, you got Crucible and Bliss, the shades of treachery and creativity all over the place. It really is as if the Shivering Isles is a reflection of the Mad God's mind, and you get to explore every single inch. But I also think it is very, very cool how as you are getting to know all of these different characters, locations, and activities within the Isles, all of those things are getting closer and closer to total destruction by the minute, and everyone knows it. This DLC has a very similar tone to a game like Majora's Mask to me, with the impending doomsday, you know? And then you have Shea Gorath's completely unpredictable nature really being foiled by how intently he is focusing in on you, making everything you do feel extremely important and weighty, though you don't totally know why yet. But just when you're having that thought, Shea reveals the true plan for his champion. Now, to the meat of your endeavor. The crux of the situation. The reason for your being here. And the likely cause of your death. You'll be stopping the Grey March. Altering the course of events. Breaking the cycle. A fly in the ointment. A new cause for a different effect. We're going to change things. No. Things will be different this time around. You'll be my champion. 
You'll grow powerful. You'll grow to be me. Prince of Madness, a new Shea Gorath. Or you'll die trying. I love that about you. Damn. And I think it's important to understand just how significant this is in the overall Elder Scrolls series. I mean, the Daedric Princes are each such singular and eternally powerful things. Deities that are as old as time itself, and for a prince to pick the main character of Oblivion, otherwise known as the Champion of Cyrodiil, to in essence replace him? It's unprecedented, man. A mortal mantling the Prince of Madness purely in an effort to throw a wrench in the cycle of the curse put on Jigalag? It's just a hell of a thing to attempt. But he does warn you that you won't be him. However, you will have power, assuming that you don't just die in the process. So, wow, okay, I'm going to become Sheagorath. Wonderful. Well, then what's next? Well, understandably, Sheagorath's subjects around the Isles aren't feeling particularly excited right now, given they're all about to get creamed by Jigalang. So, to inspire hope, you must go and light the flame of Agnon, and then you get to light the beacon in the name of Mania or Dementia, your choice. Which really highlights the next big thing Sheo has set up for you. You see, there are many here who, to save themselves, willingly join up with Jigalag to become priests of order. And if you want to have any hope in stopping the Grey March and fighting back those forces, you're going to need the people on your side. But how? You'll need to control one of the carts of madness, replace a current duke or duchess, whichever, that will command respect. So me, myself, I like to become the Duke of Mania Man, because of course, you have to murder the person you want the position of. And if you pick Thaden, you get to feed this dude some crazy drug shit that makes his heart explode during dinner. Now that is a good time. Also, please, revel in this absolutely classic, stupid-ass oblivion moment that I captured during my playthrough for this video, my god. My heart can't... Breathe. Help me. But the other duke or duchess will see how Shagorath replaced their counterpart with you and then storm out of the city, vowing to join up with Jigalag as a priest of order. Oh well. So from here, it's pretty much action time, baby. The forces of order are invading the Isles, so you, now as the duke or duchess, lead the forces to the fringe to fight them back. And it seems that the order is spreading very, very rapidly. You then run around putting out fires, killing knights, cleansing various important things of these ugly crystals. But soon, you get the sense that perhaps time has run out and you have failed. As I feared it would, my plan has failed. The Grey March is upon us, and I must go. I thought we had more time. I thought we had a chance. My plan has failed, and we were so close. Optimism! Ha! Oh, how adorable! I love it! Even at the end, you make me laugh. <laughs> I'm lying. That wasn't funny at all. No matter. Soon you and everyone else will be dead. And I will be left a mad god. Ruler of a dead realm. Again. Flee while you can, mortal. When we next meet, I will not know you. And I will slay you like the others. Oh, the realm is dead! Sheogorath is dead! All shall crumble before Jigalath! And that is the big reveal. Sheagorath isn't fighting against Jigalag, he is Jigalag. And just like that, he's gone. You are truly on your own now with Haskell, and it's time to figure out a way to gain the power of Sheagorath and prepare for the final fight against Jigalag. I mean, the Isles depend on it, but things 
ain't looking so good. However, there is a long forgotten key to the entire final act here. A man who has been around since before the curse of madness, and the only one in existence with the knowledge to guide you now. It's Dias, the Chamberlain of Jigalag from eternities ago who has been locked away within the ruins of the Great Library of Order, apparently because even Sheagorath could not fathom killing him and losing the incredible amount of knowledge within his brain. Now this guy is a bit of a stick in the mud, understandably, but very very cool to interact with as he agrees to help you assemble the staff of Sheagorath, which is the relic that will allow you to truly mantle the prince. Sheagorath has fallen and you seek the means to foil the machinations of the Prince of Order. You seek the throne of madness. However, no mortal may sit upon the throne without the staff, so here you are in my prison, seeking to supplant the one who placed me here. I just think any and all discussions with Dias are so, so cool. I mean, the voice acting is great, he seems so bitter and bored talking to you, and it's really what gives the entire storyline that immeasurable sense of scale. So even though he thinks you're gonna fail, you go to get the ingredients necessary for Dias to craft this second staff. First stop is getting the root of this ancient tree to act as the staff's shaft, where you get to fight in Ocarina of Time fashion a dark version of yourself, the reflection of the hero which then drops Shadow Rend, which is maybe my favorite weapon in the entire game. By the way, definitely check out my video on Dark Link if that sort of thematic thing appeals to you. But then it's off to go get an eyeball, which will be affixed to the top of the staff, and who better than an old crazy woman named Sirta, who survived the last Grey March and has really seen everything imaginable in the Shivering Isles. Then once you have those two things, it is back to Dias. You have defied the expected and accomplished something that denies all logic. I must contemplate the error in my calculations. Now, take your treasure and leave me. But this is honestly just a glorified twig. The staff now must bathe in the font of madness behind the throne in the throne room to be imbued with the powers of the Isles. But oh no, when you get back, the crystals of order have polluted the entire well of insanity. So you gotta go down there, kick some order ass, confront the wayward duchess, and then dip yo stick in this little fountain. But it's a good thing you got this done in time, because the final attack of the Grey March is now approaching the palace. The forces of order are closing in. I expect that this is the beginning of the final assault. The cursed usurper Jigalag himself may even take the field before the end. This is it, baby. It's time to kill a god. You hold the staff, but you are no Daedric Prince. This ends as it always does. Order shall reign. Another of Sheogura's foolish scheme. Your staff does not make you a dangerous, foolish mortal. Enough! I am beaten. The Grey March is ended. For millennia, this drama is unfolded, and each time, I have conquered this land, only to be transformed back into that gibbering fool, Sheogorav. It was not always so. Once I ruled this realm, a world of perfect order. My dominion expanded across the seas of oblivion with each passing era. The other princes, fearful of my power, cursed me with madness doomed me to live as Sheogorath, a broken soul reigning in a broken land. Once each era, I was allowed my true form, conquering this world anew. And each time I did, the curse was renewed, damning me to exist as Sheogorath. Now, though, 
You have ended the cycle. You now hold the mantle of madness, and Jigalag is free to roam the voids of oblivion once more. I will take my leave, and you will remain here, mortal. Mortal? King? God? It seems uncertain. This realm is yours. Perhaps you will grow to your station. Fare thee well, Sheogorath, Prince of Madness. Incredible. You do it, and you speak with Jigalag himself, who honestly doesn't seem like such a bad dude after all, a little boring maybe, but he is now set free. The Sheogorath we knew is gone, never to return, and it is now you, the champion of Cyrodiil, who holds the title Prince of Madness. Utterly fucking perfect, dude. Words cannot express how much I love this quest line and the way it ultimately shakes out. I feel like I replay it like once a year or so because I myself am insane. But it's so wild that Jigalag is set loose again, right? I mean, this massive threat from eons ago is now totally available to do his thing. Spread his order and cause some issues on a cosmic scale. Maybe one day we will get to see what happened to him after this. I really, really hope so. But we're going to come back to some of the analysis in just a minute, because for now, I want to just keep it moving right along to Sheagorath's appearance in Skyrim. Well, I would estimate that maybe a majority of current Elder Scrolls fans were introduced to the series because of Skyrim, and thus the very first Sheagorath they ever encountered was likely the one here, found in a very fun and unique Daedric quest that begins in the city of Solitude. But it's very, very important to note that the games in the mainline series occur in chronological order, meaning that this Sheagorath should be, well, the champion of Cyrodiil, some time after his ascension to the position. So you gotta wonder, how the hell does that work, man? I mean, this Sheagorath looks and sounds mostly like the one that we knew. Was it Molag? No, no. Little Tim. The Toymaker's son, huh? Huh? The ghost of King Lysandus? Ah, oh, order was the one. Yes, Stanley, the talking grapefruit from Passwall. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, there are many different perspectives on this for sure, and just the entire concept in these games of mantling, so I highly encourage you to form your own opinions. Don't let any self-proclaimed lore masters bully you on Reddit or anything. But I personally absolutely believe that this is the champion of Cyrodiil, and a combination of things have turned them, whoever they were, into this. So first off, I view the entire Oblivion Shivering Isles quest as kind of an invitation of madness. I mean, the door appears hearing the entire progression of events, the things that you do and see, you may think that you are in control as the player, but the player character, in my opinion, is absolutely walking deeper and deeper into complete insanity with every quest completed. I mean, Dias even says, hey, I know everything and predict everything and guess what, you're about to fail, but you, as you're transforming into the prince, defy those predictions of logic and deduction. Kinda sounds like someone else we know, right? I mean, the metamorphosis here is subtle because we don't hear our character speak or feel, but by the quest's end, I like to think you have gone absolutely batshit crazy and earned the title Prince of Madness. Second, I think that wielding the staff, wearing the garb, ruling over such a place for a couple hundred years even, would transform any living person into this kind of caricature of madness. I mean, Sheagorath's voice, the attitude, it's all a part of the kit that you inherited at the end of Oblivion. So to see him now in Skyrim look so familiar makes perfect sense to me. Because Sheagorath is the power that he wields, the madness that he embodies and spreads, regardless of who may hold that title. But of course, please, let me know what you think. So anyway, in Solitude, you can find this insane, dirty-as-hell beggar named Dervenin, who asks you to go find his master in the Pelagius Wing of the Blue Palace within the city. Now, for those of you who don't know, within the Elder Scrolls lore, Pelagius Septim III was a High King of Skyrim as well as Emperor of all Tamriel during the Third Era. But he is widely remembered as Pelagius the Mad, a ruler who was outright crazy and grew crazier by the day during his reign. 
Well, eventually he was replaced and died young alone, with his wing of the Blue Palace here in Solitude sealed off since then. But this fucking beggar says the only way he's gonna find his master is in the sealed wing, and he gives you the deceased monarch's hip bone to gain access to it. So, uh, I mean, you can tell, this has already got Sheagorath written all over. So once you enter the wing, full of cobwebs and stuff, you are magically transported into the very mind of the long-dead emperor. What the hell? Well, here he is, sitting, having a chat with the Prince of Madness himself. And it seems Shea Gorath is on a literal vacation here, and has left his duties back on the Isles completely unattended. So you are being sent by Dervenin to retrieve him. But hey, let's look closely really quick, because Dervenin is actually the priest of Mania from Oblivion. Now unfortunately for Dude, it seems he's out of work. I mean, maybe things back home are in absolute shambles without the prince around. And his sending you to the palace is actually a pretty clever little trick to throw you also right into Pelagius' mind. But once here, of course, it is another unforgettable interaction. You are far too hard on yourself, my dear, sweet, homicidally insane Pelagius. What would the people do without you? Dance, sing, smile, <laughs> grow old. You are the best septum that's ever ruled. Well, except for that Martin fella. But he turned into a dragon god, and that's hardly sporting. You know. I was there for that whole sordid affair. Marvelous time! Butterflies, blood, a fox, a severed head, ho ho ho, and the cheese to die for. Now, notice how he says he was present for the whole Oblivion stuff with Martin. I've always taken that as a nod toward him, indeed being the champion of Cyrodiil for sure. But of course, you are here to send the prince a simple message. Well, spit it out, mortal. I haven't got an eternity. Actually, I do. Little joke. But seriously, what's the message? Where you now? But what on earth would Sheo's quest be without a little task for you, a deal of sorts? So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. That's right, I'm done. Holiday! Complete! Time to return to the humdrum day to day. On one condition. You have to find the way out first. Oh, good luck with that. I know what you're thinking. Can I still rely on my swords and spells and sneaking and all that nonsense? Sure. Sure. Or you could use... The Wub Attack! Huh? Huh? Didn't see that coming, did you? So then, off you go, armed with the Wabajack as you attempt to escape the subconscious mind of an emperor who has been dead for generations. But the quest itself is super straightforward. So the mind of Pelagius was plagued by three main things. Paranoia, low confidence, and night terrors. So with the power of the Daedric Relic in your hand, you solve those issues metaphorically, and then you are finally set free. It's a really nice, but in my opinion, way too short quest for Skyrim. Now if it were up to me, Sheagorath would have a pretty sizable role in pretty much every game. And I mean every game, even like Paper Mario. So anyway, the final appearance of Sheo to date is in the Elder Scrolls Online. And I will be the first to admit that I haven't played a ton of ESO, though the hundred or so hours I spent with the game, I thoroughly enjoyed. And Sheagora actually functions as like the main antagonist for the entire Mages Guild questline here, which I find pretty cool. Even if the implementation overall of the character is just a little less interesting to me. Because I mean, first off, they had the audacity to not bring Wes Johnson in to voice the Prince of Madness. I mean, what the fuck, man? The new voice actor does like an okay job, but he sounds too high-pitched like the Joker or something. It's just all wrong. I'll give you one buck in exchange for your heart or lungs. Your choice. No, wait, I have a better idea. Let's have a contest. A contest wrapped in a mystery with an enigma glaze. Oh, what fun we'll have. Especially considering Wes voices Hermaeus Mora in the same game. There's just no excuse. I don't get it. But within the gameplay, okay, Shea Gorath had made a deal with a certain archmage of the Mages Guild a long time ago named Shalador. So in exchange for a magical tome known as the Folium Discognitum, Sheagorath was given the island of Ivia. 
Surely a pretty shit deal for the Archmage, as the Ivia was literally created by Shalador to be a haven for mages and wizards throughout the world, a place to practice magic and share knowledge with peers. So he claims that Sheagorath tricked him into this trade, literally plucked it out of Mundus and added it to the Shivering Isles. So it is up to you, as well as every other person who's ever played this game, during this quest to get it back for the Mages Guild. Well, of course, the Prince of Madness is always open to negotiations, but only if you complete four or trials. Trials that lead you to four different other ancient tomes, which are loaded with information on how you're going to summon Ivia back into Mundus. But a little tricky detail that isn't mentioned, reading those books will make you go completely insane again. What a bastard. But eventually, through hard work, boring quest design, and the power of friendship, you can indeed take back the island, purge it of all the Deidre, and call it home for the guild once more. Additionally, this quest wraps up with a very fun moral decision to make. Letting this woman, Velast, who read all the cursed tomes and went insane, either stay crazy and go to Oblivion with Sheo in exchange for the original book of magical power, or you get to cure her. And even though I'm not too fond of his voice, I think Shagorath's presence the whole way through is an absolute treat. He's just a charming son of a bitch. Also, this is the game where you get to see him as the damn skooma cat, so that is fantastic. But it's also worth noting that ESO takes place way before any of the mainline Bethesda games, back in the second era. So this is indeed the Sheagorath that we meet in Oblivion before the Grey March cycle is broken by you. And that, my friends, is all the Sheagoraths we have seen. I think Oblivion absolutely takes the cake and feels like the most true form of the character, but all of these games offer something very unique that help create the entire portrait of the Prince of Madness. When reflecting on this character, the different tales about him, the journeys he has taken us on, and anticipating the inevitable continuation of his role in the future with The Elder Scrolls VI, I definitely feel that he is the best written Daedric Prince out of all 16, or 17 I guess if we want to include Jigalag now. And sure, they are all undeniably fascinating and have massive potential as far as storytelling, but very few have been given this level of attention and exploration across the series. But one thing that I really want to share my thoughts on is just the curse of madness, Jigalag, and how we really define insanity. Now listen, I am not alone on this train of thought whatsoever, but I have always felt pretty strongly that, in a way, Jigalag, was always the Prince of Madness. Now, sure, we refer to this dude as the Prince of Order, yada yada whatever, but let's look at the basic facts, dude. In his pure, original form, this was a prince that had a natural pull to organization and reason. And he, very comfortably, began to put things around him in line, with his eyes on the whole of oblivion. A realm that he, as the prince who knows everything, would know is inherently an infinite chaotic place ruled over by other entities that align themselves with a much more topsy-turvy, dynamic, ever-changing well of power. Even though he had success, he was attempting something that in my opinion he would have known was impossible. I mean, obviously, because the other princes only let him get so far, right? But just the concept alone of what he was doing borders on a sort of obsessive insanity in itself. Then you have the fact that he had this great library, with every logical prediction of events forever, from anything, anyone, whatever. Then of course it stands to reason that within that library held the prediction that he would be cursed by his brothers and sisters to be Sheagorath. I mean, maybe he even saw this prediction himself, and knowing that fact led him toward his inevitable doom in some way. Then you have the Grey March, where every era Jigalag in his complete 100% power willingly goes forth to conquer and destroy the Isles, knowing that he is cursed to then turn right back into Sheagorath when the task is done. I mean, I hate to be that guy, but we all know that famous quote, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. When in truth, it's Sheagorath, the supposed crazy version of the prince, who seeks to end that cycle. I just really, for many reasons, don't buy the idea of Jigalag being this cold machine of order and rationality. I like to think of him more as just the original prince of madness. It's just that it was madness in a form that resembled obsession, compulsive tendencies that led him to have these certain thresholds that needed to be met regardless of the consequences to the rest of the princes or their respect 
respective realms. A brand of madness that was far too destructive and totalitarian for those other princes to deal with, so they merely woke up Jigalag to the fact of his insanity, and cursed him to experience that awakening forever and ever, as it would be the only way to cage the threat of order as well as madness. Because in the form of Sheagorath, madness is manifested as just unpredictability, comedy, violence, revelry, inspiration, art, and whatever else this dude feels in the moment. And while he is still an extremely powerful and dangerous prince, those are all elements that are much more familiar to the other Deidre. Now that is just my tin foil hat rant. But aside from all that, I also just think it is vital for the legacy of this character to remember that we, the players, enjoy this kind of humorous and open-armed Sheagorath in a way that the people of this fantasy universe certainly do not. I mean, we are playing these games as legendary heroes of prophecy, influential beyond words. So of course, a character like Sheagorath takes genuine interest in us, purely because of what we could possibly do for him. But the extended lore of the Elder Scrolls, dude, it's chock full of the terror that this prince strikes into the hearts of the average man. He is depression, doubt, derangement, all of the things that we have discussed. A god that could show up at any moment to drive you, your loved ones, or even your king mad just for his own amusement. An absolutely horrifying character in the abstract. And honestly, it is a privilege and luxury for us to view him as such a charming little devil. Overall, guys, I just think the legacy of Shea Gorath is, well, insane. His impact on the fans of this series and video games at large is immeasurable. The handful of games that he has showed up in, the incredible performance by Wes Johnson, the marvelous backstory and unique presence he brings to the table, the way it ties in the player and you take his seat, it all just comes together to create one of the best video game characters of all time. And that is not up for debate, baby. A god of darkness with an unknown, un knowable agenda, who is just as likely to write you a poem as he is to rip off your legs and beat you to death with them. And even still, he will probably still write you the poem. So always remember, I am a part of you, little mortal. I'm a shadow in your subconscious, a blemish on your fragile little psyche. You know me, you just don't. Thank you everybody so much for watching and listening to the end. As always, it means the world. Shout out to all of my wonderful patrons. Now, I want you all to enjoy this special little message from a very familiar face. And until next time, peace. I want to know, how are things going on your channel? Are you doing well? Are things mad? Are they going crazy? Do you have yourself a staff of Shea Gorath? Would you like one? Because, you know, if you have one for over 200 years, then you become me and I become you, and then I would have the Ghost Charm channel. Or then again, perhaps I'll just pluck your eyes and add them right here to the staff. This is looking a wee bit dry, and yours are looking rather moist. Yes. Or what you'd really need is a Wabajack! Huh? Huh? Oh, it's lovely. Yes, indeed. You could be right in the middle of doing something on your Ghost Charm channel. I zap you. Zoom! Pow! Next thing you know, you're a mud crab. And that makes for very, very terrible interviewing. Just clip, 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 clip. What was that? I didn't catch it. Clip, 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 clip. Ah, well, you don't want it. That's all I got to say. So, keep listening to Ghost Charm, or else I'll have to skip rope with your entrails. Ta-ta.